Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship on this day when we will celebrate St. Mark's 66th anniversary as a, as a congregation, 66 years of service to this community um, in a, as, as a worshiping community. So I, I think that is something to celebrate, particularly uh, on, at a time in the world when we are hearing of so many churches that are closing. I think continuing to worship and being a presence in our community is absolutely something to celebrate. Um, this week after church, I would invite you to stay for a piece of our anniversary cake. And there are also some uh, extra goodies that were left by uh, Carrie and Steve Leopard following their wedding here yesterday. Um, if you don't know, Carrie is the one who takes such good care of our building. She cleans it for us every week. And uh, she, is, she and Steve are just a delightful couple. So if you should run into her in the next few weeks, make sure that you offer her your best wishes, um, offer them your best wishes on, on their wedding that took place here yesterday. And we, we thank them for their generosity in sharing uh, some of their treats. In recognition of those who walked this land before us here in Simcoe County, we acknowledge that we gather on uh, the ancestral territory of the Anishinaabek nations, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi, who collectively are known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We remember, too, the people of the Wendat who once made this land their home. I hope that we all acknowledge with regret that in the past we've not lived in harmony with the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and our relationship has not been one of true friendship based on honesty and generosity and mutual respect. Today we recognize the enduring presence of the people of the Chippewa Tri Council, Beausoleil First Nation, Jordina Island First Nation and the Chippewas of Rama First Nations, as well as the people of the Métis Nation, the Inuit, and other First Nations that call this land their home. May we all recognize that we have much to learn from the history and culture and teachings of the Indigenous peoples with whom we now share this land. And may we all be committed to nurturing a spirit of respect, honesty, and reconciliation with all of our First Nations, Métis, and Inuit neighbors. I want to welcome back with us Linda Lewis, who is sharing with us her musical gifts today. It's wonderful to have you with us, and uh, you're always welcome. Well, it's great, great to have you here on such a special day. Uh, there are several special days to celebrate within our congregational family this week. On Tuesday, it's Jim and Nancy Hamill's wedding anniversary. So, Jim, there's a heads up for you. <laughs> Don't forget. <laughs> On Friday, it's Marilyn Brockbank's birthday. There's a heads up for you, Jerry. <laughs> and uh, many of you will remember with great fondness Mary Jo Wilson, our previous uh, musical director, and it's her birthday on Saturday. So let's sing to them all. This week, uh, Knit One, Pray Two continues to um, prepare for our Christmas bazaar. Um, I heard a suggestion that perhaps we could gather at 9 o'clock rather than 10 o'clock. And if you'd like to bring your lunch and so that uh, there's a longer time uh, of, of fun and fellowship and preparation, uh, you would be most welcome to do that. So Tuesday from 9 to mid-afternoon, if you can stay that long, just come and stay as long as you, as you can. And uh, it really is a wonderful time of fellowship and fun. Tuesday evening at 7, the Board of Managers meet. Um, and some advanced planning. Next Sunday, I will be away on a week of vacation. Reverend Gord will be leading worship here. Um, on Wednesday of this week, I'll be leaving for Washington State to take part in a photography workshop there. So the colors are a little bit behind where we are, and I got an email from the leader of the workshop saying, 
it's going to be peak colors when you are when you're there. So I believe him, <laughs> and um, I'm looking forward to that. So if you have any pastoral emergencies, please contact Irene Malik, our clerk of session, and she will put you in touch with the appropriate resources. Um, on November 5th, which is a few weeks from now, but this is uh, an important announcement, we're going to be celebrating All Souls, All Saints Day. And we've been thinking about the many people who uh, have, have contributed to St. Mark's over the many years that we have been in existence. And many of those people now belong to the communion of saints that surround us as we worship every week. And so we're going to invite you to bring in or send either to uh, Linda Piercy or to Irene um, any photos you might have of people who have gone before us who are part of this congregation. There are many, many of them. And we'd like to create a display of those members of the communion of saints so that we remember them with thanksgiving on that day. So if you have any photos of folks who were part of the church who have now gone before us, I would invite you to send them in or bring them. You can bring in a photo if you don't have it electronically. And uh, through the magic of Irene, they'll be scanned. And, um, and hopefully we'll be able to put together a presentation for during church, but also uh, to have downstairs following worship that day where we can look and see how many people we all remember. Also that day, we will, after the service is done, just at the close of the service, we'll remember and celebrate the life of Christina Burns. Many of you remember Christina. Uh, she died over the summer, and her, her interment happened very quickly. There was not a service for her, but, you know, she was an important part of our congregation for many years, and I thought it would be nice to acknowledge, ha give people a chance to acknowledge that in some way. So I've been in touch with her cousin, and we're going to do it following worship on November the 5th. Uh, as well, on November 11th, it's our Christmas Bazaar Day. We will be pausing for a minute of silence at 11 o'clock um, remem for Remembrance Day. Um, but it is our, our Christmas Bazaar, so you can let folks in the community know that. And on December 15th, it is going to be our cookie walk, which many of you remember with great fondness. It's not going to be where people are trooping through and choosing their own cookies again this year because of um, COVID, but uh, there will be, uh, we'll give you more details closer to that date, um, but it is going to be held on December 15th. Are there any other announcements, Irene, that I'm forgetting? No? Okay. Well, let's just take a moment now to quiet our hearts and our minds as we prepare to worship God. I would invite you now to join in our responsive call to worship. We gather in God's holy presence where God embraces us with grace. We glorify God who yearns for justice for the last and the least. We give thanks to God for God's persistent love that seeks us out. So come, let us worship God together. Our introit is Gather Us In. And uh, just a note about the hymns for today, I chose hymns that I thought would reflect um, it being our anniversary Sunday. So I think this is a very appropriate way to start this service. Gather Us In. And if you're able, I would invite you to stand.
Now I would invite you to turn your hearts to God in prayer. Gracious God, in love you open wide the doors and welcome us into your presence, saints and sinners alike. You spread a table before us filled with the richest fare, a feast of love and mercy for the body and soul. We come with joy to meet you here, to taste and celebrate your goodness, to see your grace and mercy in our lives. May your spirit inspire our praise and thanksgiving as we worship together in your presence. O oh God, even as we offer you our praise, we must confess the many ways our lives fall short of your hopes and desires for us. You invite us to a banquet, and yet too often we don't even respond. You set us a place at the table, but we find excuses not to come. You lovingly prepare for our arrival, and yet we ignore your efforts. Forgive us, God. You are a God of creation. You give us a world capable of abundance, but we act as if it is a world of scarcity. You give us the resources and the intelligence to provide for all, and yet we lack the will and the vision to feed all of your children. Forgive us, God, for filling our plates while others go hungry. God of love, you call us to be the body of Christ in the world, but we hoard the blessings of communion for ourselves. Instead of loving our neighbors, we're consumed by the love of self. Instead of loving you, we bow before idols of our own making. Forgive us, God. God of hope, too often we avert our eyes when we see hunger and need. We close our ears to the cries of the poor and the oppressed. We refuse to let our minds be open to the realities of our world. We refuse to let our hearts overflow with love and compassion. Forgive us, God. God of mercy, as you once again call us to your table, help us to respond in faith. Forgive our failures and help us to learn from them. Change our hearts and our minds as we hear your good news proclaimed. Help us to taste and see the goodness you have prepared for us and for all the world. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, hear this word of good news that we find in the gospel. While it is true that we have all sinned, it is a greater truth that we are all forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. May you know that your sins are forgiven. May you live in peace with yourself and others and with God. Thanks be to God for the gift of forgiveness. Amen. Our first hymn is Word of God Across the Ages, and if you're able, I would invite you to stand.
I was reflecting on the many years that this church has been in existence and the wonderful witness to the love of God and Jesus Christ that it has been over the years in this community. And I know that it wasn't always through worship services that this happened. I think it most often happens when people come into contact with those who worship here and, they, and people see something in those people that they would like to have in their own lives. I think sometimes we forget that it doesn't take much to make a difference to the people we come in contact with. And so I want to share with you a story of something that happened to me just this weekend. Some of you know my lack of abilities with uh, technology, and uh, I was trying to load a new program onto my computer, a photography program, in uh, anticipation of my trip this week, and I, I believe that I will need this to be working on my computer when I go on that trip. I, it was Friday night, and I started what I thought was good time, about 8 o'clock. I purchased this program, and I tried to download it and install it on my computer. It was about 10 o'clock when I called the helpline um, because it wasn't working, and I, uh, they said their, their volume of calls is really large right now. Would you like someone to call you back? So I pressed 1. Yes, I would like someone to call me back. <clears throat> About 10 to 11, I got a call back from a lovely gentleman uh, who, who, in the end, was able to help me. He was very, very uh, wise and good at his job. As I was speaking to him, I noticed that he had a different accent than I had. And so during one of the many breaks we had while he was playing with m the screen on my computer and doing I don't know what, um, I said, where, where are you talking to me from? And he paused, and he didn't say anything for probably about five seconds. And then he said, India. And I said, wonderful. I said, what's the weather like in India today? And we started chatting about weather and the time of year it was and what winter was like where we were and what winter was going to be like where he was. We continued chatting as he was asking me all these technical questions. And finally, it all was working. Some of my photography came up on the screen so he could see it. And he started asking me about the pictures I had taken, what kind of animals they were. And uh, we, he saw deer, he saw bears, he saw loons. And he said, have you ever taken a picture of a lion? I said, no. <laughs> I have not. But <laughs> anyway, it was at the end of the call, after we had a nice chat and he got everything working absolutely perfectly, he thanked me probably about 10 times for being so kind. And I thought, I don't think I was particularly kind, <laughs> but I wasn't criticizing him because he was from India. I wasn't criticizing him because he spoke with an accent. I was just treating him like I would treat anyone else, like one of God's children. It doesn't take much to make a difference in someone's life. And so as you, as you continue to worship here and be a witness for God and for the difference that Christ can make in your life, I hope you remember that. It doesn't take much to make a difference. And you will be making a difference for God's kingdom as you treat others as children of God. Amen. Our hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness, and I would invite you to stand as we sing.
As we turn to read scripture, let's ask God to bless our reading of God's word. Let us pray. O God of prophets and parables, we gather to listen to the scriptures read and proclaimed. By your spirit, grant us fresh understanding and challenge us to live according to your transforming grace. Amen. I'm going to invite Mary Silk to come forward and lead us in reading scripture. start with Psalm 106, 1 to 6, and um, we'll read responsibly. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. We will proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord, or fully declare his grace. Blessed are those who act justly, who always do what is right. Remember me, Lord, when you show favor to your people. Come to my aid when you see That I may enjoy the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may share in the joy of your nation and join your inheritance. Oops. We have sinned, even as our ancestors did. We have done wrong. At Horeb, they made a calf and worshipped an idol cast from metal. They exchanged their glorious God for an image of gold, which eats grass. They forgot the God who saved them, who had done great things in Egypt. So he said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to keep his wrath from destroying them? Now we'll go to Philippians chapter 4, 1 to 9. And in my Bible, the title is Closing Appeal for Steadfastness and Unity. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord 
in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yuoda and I plead with Sinteki to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contented at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. The title for this next part is Final Exhortations. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> Our gospel reading today is taken from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. The parable of the wedding banquet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In the name of God the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, and God the Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. Well, I have yet another confession to make to you. As I was doing some advanced planning for sermon preparations a number of weeks ago, I glanced very quickly at our gospel reading for today. I read the first few lines. I didn't read it in its entirety. I just took a glance at it, and that was a mistake, because in doing so, I presumed it was 
the story that generated that song I learned in Sunday school so many years ago about the excuses people made for not attending the banquet their master had invited them to. Now, Alison, you particularly might remember this one. I cannot come. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me excused. I cannot come. How many of you know that song? We should have been singing it. <laughs> and I thought to myself when I thought that was the story, that's no problem. We were in the middle of our series about come to the table, and I thought that gospel reading would be a great continuation of the themes that we were exploring. So imagine how my heart sank when I sat down to begin my exegesis of this passage and realized I had been thinking of a different version of this story. When I read of invited guests abusing and killing the servants who were delivering their invitations, and then the response of the king who lashed out in anger and murdered his subjects and burned their city, well, it was almost too close to reality for me this week. And I wondered what Jesus could have been thinking when he told this story. I wondered where in this story would I find the good news that is promised to us in the gospel. Now, I do recall reading something the New Testament scholar Luke Timothy Johnson said about the authority of Scripture. He said, when we say the Bible has authority for us, we mean that even when we think it's wrong, we believe the Bible has something to teach us. We pay attention to it, even when we think it's wrong. Carla Pratt Keyes, a preacher I enjoy listening to, had some interesting reflections on this passage, and so I want to incorporate some of her thoughts this morning in the hope that we can in find, indeed find some good news in this passage. In this passage from Matthew, God or Jesus is speaking again in parables. And this parable is about a great banquet. Now, the image of a banquet is not a new one in Scripture, even as an image for the kingdom of God. In the Psalms and the prophets of the Hebrew Bible, we read about tables being prepared and cups overflowing for individuals. Think of Psalm 23. We, th we hear of wonderful tables being set for nations and even for all the earth. But sometimes those banquet images were not always so generous. Between the times that the Old and the New Testaments were written down, stories were told imagining God's chosen eating and relaxing and laughing at the Gentile rulers who had been oust outed ousted and punished. In other words, the pure and the righteous were imagined to be welcomed by God, while the so-called sinners, who in those days would have included people with illnesses and physical disabilities, well, they were excluded from the banquet. But Jesus told these stories in a different way. He was famous for uh, telling stories uh, in the way that he lived, in the way that he acted out his beliefs. He was known for sitting to eat with all kinds of people. He was criticized for that, by the way, because many of the people he would sit and eat with would have been considered to be impure. But in Jesus' telling, every time Jesus tells a story, God's banquet is for everyone, especially those you might least expect to be sitting at Jesus' table. So Jesus talked about God's banquet, and Jesus told parables that talked about a banquet. And over the course of his ministry, I suspect that Jesus told today's parable many times, just like anyone tells a good story over and over again. And depending on his context and mood and the point he was trying to make, Jesus may have told that story in different ways at different times. 
And the folks who wrote Jesus' life story down for us, folks like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they recorded what they remembered or had heard about Jesus. And as they wrote for their particular communities, it's likely that their memory and their agenda had some impact on what exactly they wrote. You will notice that the Gospels are not all the same. They wrote things down depending on the context that they lived in. So context matters. Perhaps that would explain my initial confusion about this story, because I was remembering the story as recorded in the Gospel of Luke. When Luke tells Christ's banquet parable, the guests do make elaborate excuses for not being able to come to the banquet. And when they don't come, the master accepts that, and the poor and the crippled and the lame are welcomed to take their place. This version of Christ's story is consistent with Luke's understanding that Jesus calls us to have a special concern for the poor rather than the rich, for the handicapped rather than the strong. But as for Matthew, which we're reading today, he wanted on some level to help his early Christian community, which was a Jewish community. Matthew was Jewish. Jews who were choosing to follow Jesus. He wanted to help them understand who they were and how God was going to save them. Many scholars believe that when Matthew wrote this story down, he started with that core banquet story, like the one that we find in Luke, the one that had been told by Jesus. And then Matthew added some things, things that he must have believed were faithful to Christ's intent, things that were meant to help his community know Christ's purposes for them. So, for instance, in Matthew's rendition of this story, it's not just any banquet, it's a wedding banquet for the king's son. Matthew understood this parable to be an allegory of salvation. The people of Israel had been chosen by God, but they had rejected God's son. And Matthew's supposed additions to the parable were to make those connections clear to the people listening to the story. What's more, in this parable, the slaves bearing invitations are abused and killed, much like many of God's prophets to Israel. They were also abused and in some cases killed when the people didn't like what they said. And then also the city is burned as punishment. Matthew had witnessed the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and there's reason to think that he understood the fall of that city to be God's punishment for the way Jerusalem had rejected Jesus Christ. Remember, Jerusalem is where Christ was crucified. Perhaps Matthew included the burning of the city in his version of the parable to underline what he thought would be the devastating consequences of rejecting Jesus as God's Messiah. Matthew was a little bit more uh, hellfire and brimstone than I tend to be. So what about the guest who came to the wedding in such inappropriate attire that he would be punished by being banished to outer darkness where weeping and gnashing of teeth held sway? I do not think Jesus would hold someone responsible if a proper wardrobe was out of reach through no fault of their own. So why did Matthew add that detail? Well, Matthew certainly would have understood that the people in his community were called to be baptized into a new identity in Christ, just as we all are baptized into a new identity in Christ. And that identity is described in, in much of the early Christian literature and letters as being like a garment, a garment someone would put on. We're meant to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness and patience. Does that sound familiar? Matthew knew it would have sounded familiar to his community, and perhaps when they heard this part of the story, they would have responded by saying, that man not wearing wedding clothes, well, he wasn't attired in the baptismal garments of Christ. In other words, he wasn't acting 
as a Christian should. So the bottom line is this, I think. This story told by Matthew does hold some good news for us because it's a story that Jesus told to describe God's kingdom. And that kingdom is a space that God makes for people, for all people, for people who you don't actually expect could make it into God's kingdom. Maybe they're poor and blind and lame. Maybe they're good, but maybe they're evil. And whatever these people are like, They haven't earned a place at God's table. Their inclusion at this table is a gift of grace, a gift they're meant to enjoy in responsible ways. A place at God's table is a gift we're all meant to enjoy in responsible ways. It was just a year ago that I was preparing for my trip to the Holy Land, to Israel and Palestine. And this week, viewing so many horrific images of places Jesus walked was difficult to say the least. It was heartbreaking. As Christians, how do we respond to this in a responsible way? Well, I absolutely admit that at a time like this, the big world feels way too often overwhelming and outside of our ability to change or affect change. We often tell ourselves that there isn't much we can do as individuals, that we just aren't equipped to do anything. Well, I'm not an expert. But I think we, st- we start by living as Christ would expect his disciples to live, with a call to love, to treat one another with care and dignity, to embrace the gift of life. Sadly, among Christians and deeply faithful people of other faiths, sometimes these ways of living are missing. So here's what Maria Shriver suggested in her weekly column. What we can do is work towards common ground. We can all commit to lowering our rhetoric and listening to learn. We can commit to being kind and to raising up one another instead of demonizing the other. We can commit to working together to ensure that our best days are in our future. We can commit to the power of love, love for one another regardless of religion, ethnicity, or gender. That's where our future rests. That's where our hope resides. And we can pray, because prayer does change things. So please, Pray for peace, both for Israel and Palestine. Carla Pratt Keyes, who I mentioned before, described a diagram she had seen that illustrated the ways human indifference can worsen and manifest itself in acts of violence. This diagram she saw was in the shape of a pyramid. And at the bottom, at the widest part, was indifference. People not caring about other people, people just getting wrapped up in their own concerns. And and as you moved up the pyramid, what happened? Well, people began thinking that they were better than other people. They wanted to earn their place at the table. They disparaged people who couldn't do that. And then moving further up the pyramid, judgment becomes discrimination. And discrimination becomes a call for exclusion, and then imprisonment, and then violence against the other. Remember the abuse and killing of the servants in the parable? Well, the particular diagram that Carla was referring to was called the Pyramid of White Supremacy. But really, any time we're indifferent to one another, any time we judge or lash out against people we don't understand, 
It's a step we take toward burning our own cities down. There's a teaching in the Babylonian Talmud, ancient Jewish writings that tell us that God arises several times each night, unable to rest, and roars like a lion in pain, crying out over the brokenness of our world. In the kingdom of heaven, God responds to human hatred and violence like a raging, howling lion. When I have woken in the night this week and find myself unable to sleep, perhaps it's the anguish of the roaring lion that I'm hearing. So again, I ask, how are we, Christians, good and bad alike, clothed in the garments of Christ, how are we expected to live? John Pavlovitz, author of A Bigger Table, Building Messy, Authentic, and Hopeful Spiritual Community, said this in an article. I'm tired. I'm tired of professed Christians preaching a Jesus that they seem to have no interest at all in emulating. Of religious people being a loud, loveless noise in the world while claiming to speak for a God who is supposedly love. I'm starting a new church, Pavlovich said, the church of not being horrible. Our mission statement is simply this, don't be horrible to people. Don't treat them as less worthy of love, respect, dignity, joy, and opportunity than you are. Don't create character caricatures out of them based on their skin color, their religion, their sexual orientation, the amount of money they have, the circumstances they find themselves in. Don't seek to take away things from them that you already enjoy in abundance. Civil rights, clean water, education, marriage, access to health care. Don't tell someone's story for them about why they are poor, depressed, addicted, victimized, or alone. Well, those are strong words. But I hope you will think about them, and I hope you will take them to heart. I hope we will all show up to the great wedding banquet wearing the right clothes, the clothes that symbolize life, and hope, and trust, and promise, and joy. Because that will truly be good news. Amen. Our hymn is number 477, Your Hand, O God, Has Guided.
Let us join our hearts together as we offer our prayers for the world. O oh God, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving for your faithful love. Your love never fails, not even when we turn away from you, when we ignore your invitation to us, or desert you for gods of our own making. Yet even then you do not, do not abandon us, but you reach out again and again, inviting us back into relationship once more. As you welcome us, so you welcome our prayers. We bring them to you now with confidence, knowing that you will hear and answer. Eternal God, you know our history of complicated conflicts, tense polarization, and situations so politicized that we're afraid to say or pray anything. And yet we know you grieve the violence of war and condemn acts of terrorism. We know you grieve the historical suffering of Jews and Palestinians. May our prayers for peace be uttered out loud for all to hear. Our prayers for diplomacy and for difficult yet faithful conversations to resume. God, we groan in grief over the news of this war in Israel and Gaza. Pave a path toward peace in this age-old and tragic conflict. Protect the innocent wherever bombs of destruction fall. Be with those who are captured and the families of those who are captured. Offer a way out for those who are trapped. Awaken us to our common humanity, our common human deeds, no matter the walls we build. We pray for our country, Canada, and for its people, for our government leaders, both federal and local, for our judicial system and police forces and military, for our cities and towns and rural communities, for employers and employees, for young and old, for all who are part of our country, we ask that you would hear our prayer. We pray for this congregation, our brothers and sisters in Christ, we thank you that we are able to be present to celebrate our 66th anniversary with this, this day. We also pray for those who are ill or whose loved ones are ill, those who are anxious about the future or struggling with their faith. We give you particular thanks for those who minister among us, for all your people in this place, O oh Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayer. Pour out your spirit on us. Fix our hearts and our minds on what is true and honorable and right. Give us the joy and peace that comes from knowing and doing your will. Keep us faithful to the call we have received in Christ Jesus our Lord, extending your loving invitation to all the world around us. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul, as Mary shared with us earlier, urges us to think on things that are honorable and just, commendable and true. To share what we have is honorable, and our gifts can help to create justice and work for truth to prevail. As we give our gifts with generous hearts, know that God is pleased. The offering will now be received.
Generous God, we offer to you part of the abundance you share with us. Bless our gifts and work through them so that others will know your generosity and be touched by your love through the kindness we can offer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn is Forth in Thy Name, O Lord, I Go. Once again, remind you to or invite you to come to the table to share a, a piece of our anniversary cake following the service. Life is short, and there is not much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk the way with us. So make haste to love, be swift to be kind, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen.